Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're here for AP Automation and Tax Compliance. This is a, uh, a joint webinar between TradeShift and Thomson Reuters. I uh, really appreciate everyone coming in, joining us here. We've got some, uh, we've got a star-studded lineup of uh, speakers for you. I do want to give our uh, audience just a couple of minutes to come in. Sorry, not minutes, seconds. We don't have that much time. So um, normally I like to uh, tell a joke at this moment in time or talk about the weather, but I won't for the sake of for the sake of uh, brevity. We will uh, we will begin. So once again, welcome. It's October fourth. This is a webinar between Trade Shift and Thomson Reuters. We want to talk about AP automation and tax compliance. So if that's what you signed up for, you're in the right place. And a um, little bit of housekeeping for us. Uh, I really want you to make the most of this webinar. We have a runtime of around 45 minutes, but um, it could be a little bit longer, conceivably shorter. I doubt it. Um, but what I want you to do is feel very engaged. So I want you to ask questions. Um, and stay till the very end. We've got uh, a really nice uh, agenda. I'll tell you about it in a second. And we will have a QA and a at the end. If we don't get to your question, we will absolutely get that question answered uh, after the fact. And, um, and of course, if you have to drop off or, um, I mean, you wouldn't hear me if I told you if you weren't here, uh, you'll get the recording uh, by email anyways. So don't worry about that. If you miss something or you want to share it with a friend, you'll get the recording by email. Obviously, um, you're going to be muted, but as said, uh, ask your questions and uh, it's conceivable some of our, you know, some of those questions will get answer answered in the chat as we go along. But like I said, we'll answer them uh, after the fact, if not. And um I want you to, uh, you know, be aware of what comes next after this webinar. Um, so you can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, and uh, and then you'd be always up to date. So here's our agenda. We'll do a brief little uh, introduction. Um, we'll talk about digital transformation and finance, zeroing in on AP and the role of tax compliance. Uh, we'll talk about uh, trade shift and the uh, Thomson Reuters solution one source. And we'll be able to uh, uh, demo that for you as well. So, um, and then we'll do a Q&A uh, if, if time allows. And I, I, I do believe there will be time. So it's a, it's a fairly tight agenda, but I think there's a lot here. A lot of speakers is what I meant. My name is Rowan Lemley. I'm in the top right-hand corner there. I'm the director of product marketing here at TradeShip. And um, I want to thank uh, Kelly Lear and uh, Al Moritea. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Al. You can correct me uh, in a minute. Um, I want to thank you both for being here. You're kind of the guests of honor here as, uh, as our valued partners from Thomson Reuters. On the uh, trade shift side, we've got uh, Ralph Norjensen. We've got Rizwan Malik. Uh, sorry, Ralph, he's our uh, basically SVP of engineering. and uh, and uh, and our payment solution, which is kind of the flagship here at uh, TradeShift. And then Rizwan Malik, he is our head of value engineering and Eric Srak is a solution consultant, but he's so much more than that. And he will shine uh, later on in this in this webinar. So lots, uh, lots, lots of people contributing. We hope you contribute too through questions and comments. And um, at this point, I wanna invite Rolf to Introduce the value partnership, introduce trade shift, and uh, and then I know Rolf is going to be joined by uh, Kelly to uh, introduce Thompson Reuters. Rolf, over to you. Thank you very much, Rowan. Great um, way to get us started here. I will speak very, very briefly first about what is trade shift, uh, who are we, um, and then hand it, hand it over to to Kelly to to talk about uh, Thompson Reuters. Uh, first of all, I'm super excited for this webinar, uh, super excited to be uh, demonstrating uh, what we have coming out uh, on our 
long list of capabilities adding to that in our uh, very tight integration with Thompson Reuters and their uh, tax uh, services. A little bit about TradeShift. Um, we are a business network. Uh, we are many things. Um, we have been around for a long time. Uh, we uh, have, uh, we're very happy and privileged to work with uh, some of the biggest companies in the world in all uh, areas uh, of the world uh, globally uh, from many different industries serving uh, their needs and requirements um, when it comes to accounts payable automation, e-invoicing, and so forth. And if we go to the next uh, slide, Ron, uh, actually quite a few different solution areas. Uh, so at the heart of everything, we are a network. We connect companies, facilitate the trade. If you're a company on TradeShift, you can use us for accounts payable automation, uh, for selling things in a marketplace, being a marketplace operator. Um, one of the areas where uh, we see a lot of growth and a lot of interest and a lot of very interesting projects is that we basically enable companies to operate marketplaces and invite buyers and sellers. Um, so, so super exciting space. We do a lot of things um, and fundamental uh, and uh, certain in life is, of course, as we all know, death and taxes. So uh, Pretty happy that we can, uh, with the help from Thompson Reuters, cover off the taxes bit. And with that, I want to hand it over to you, Kelly, uh, to talk a little bit about Thompson Reuters. And also, thank you and Thompson Reuters for this uh, really, really good partnership that I'm super uh, excited to bring to our customers. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rolf. Um, so my name is Kelly Lear. I'm a vice president of partnerships and alliances and head up all of our technology partnerships um, and strategic alliances. Um, one of which is, is trade shift that we are very excited about um, and gaining traction with it. They're very important to us and our customers because um you know, we want to make sure that we seamlessly integrate and extend our product and content um, so that co companies can navigate globally through all the regulatory um, planning, tax compliance, the calculations that are required uh, to, to be in compliance uh, globally, um, and also to remit uh, taxes, manager cash taxes, et cetera, uh, globally. So Thomson Reuters, just to give you a little bit of background on who we are, if you're not aware, uh, Thomson Reuters has been around for over a hundred years. Um, we're headquartered out of Toronto, Canada, um, but have offices globally. Uh, we're in over a hundred countries uh, and have over 25,000 employees. Um, but if you, a lot of folks recognize us first from Reuters News Agency, which is one of the largest uh, media uh, and news agencies in the world. Um, and, but we have really all the compliance uh, content and software solutions from our platform uh, that help businesses run their organizations globally in terms of um, understanding uh, based on who they are, where they're operating and what they're providing for products and services, um, what are the regulatory requirements, um, the calculations, the reporting or information reporting that's needed uh, in every country or jurisdiction uh, around the globe um, and be able to do that real time. And so we allow for that through our uh, platform, uh, which is called OneSource. And we integrate that and have um, made that very seamless uh, with the Trade Shift team so that we can help you uh, globally through our content and software solutions. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of background there. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Al Morataya. I'm a senior systems engineer based out of Atlanta, Georgia. I've been with Thompson Reuters for almost 10 years. Time flies when you're having fun. So all that time, uh, we're corporate in our tax division. So what we'll talk about is uh, about one, our OneSource platform, which OneSource is a family of product that covers everything related to tax, uh, tax and trade, and it's offered in one single platform 
So what you see on the right is whatever we cover in regards to tax compliance, provisions, global trade, and more. But specifically today, we will concentrate on indirect tax, and you will see how the one source indirect tax solution will interact with uh, trade shifts. So uh, indirect tax is simply a part of this huge platform. So you will see, as I mentioned, how in real time we will be able to calculate tax not only for uh, requisitions, uh, for POs, and, 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 and also for the validation of vendor tax. Not only we support the U.S. and Canada when it comes to transactions, but over 200 countries and territories around the world and all those fund tax jurisdictions around the world as well. One source is a true native solution, and we actually have provided uh, cloud solutions even before cloud was cool, uh, more than 20 years ago. And the way would he provide even double redundancy, which in itself sounds redundant, uh, there is no downtime whatsoever whenever we upgrade the software or whenever we update the tax content. And if we go to the next slide, we're going to see a couple of other things that it's easier to tell you the countries that we support, uh, that we do not support instead of the ones that we support. As you see, we paint the uh, globe orange. Uh, and the only countries that really we don't support will be places like Cuba, our dear friends up, up there in North Korea, Mali, a few places where there might be a uh, uh, UN embargo or, or, or there might be a uh, conflict in the world. When it comes to the U.S., please next. We cover more than 28,000 jurisdictions and taxes and fees. And, and when, I say, when, when I say jurisdictions, not only we're talking about states, we're talking about counties. Then down in Louisiana, we're talking about parishes, uh, Pennsylvania, and, and that area in New England as well. We cover uh, townships and more. And when it comes to Canada, next, please. Of course, Canada, we cover all those fun, fun Canadian taxes like HST, PST, QST, and everything else. So thank you very much. Thank you both. That's a great introduction. And um, I actually, I'm surprised. I didn't even know that Thomson Reuters was Canadian. I'm Canadian. And um, I think about the tax system that I uh, I experience, and it makes perfect sense uh, that we would need something like Thomson Reuters and that we would invent something like Thomson Reuters. So that's uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> one more thing over here. I forgot that we had an extra an extra slide. So I mentioned the uh, one source and the right tax solution is part of the huge uh, uh, one source family of products. So exactly... Uh, what is one source, right? So uh, one source in direct tax is our solution that covers anything that is indirect tax. And when it comes to that, you require tax calculation, not only for all the crazy fun taxes that we have in the United States, when I mentioned Canada, but also GST in places like, uh, uh, like Australia, also in India and VAT across the EU and everything else. So that's exactly what global tax research is all about. And that's only one of the other parts uh, that, that, that comprise, that made up the one source platform. Uh, another piece is the actual heart and soul of the entire suite, which is the engine itself, is what you see on the right hand side. You see three quadrants that happen to be in green. Those are the things that clients do not have to do anymore. The things that we provide to you rates, tax logic, and rules. And tax logic would be something like if you purchase downloadable software in California, uh, downloadable software in California by law happens to be uh, tax exempt. So those are the pieces that we provide to you. The fourth quadrant in, 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 in orange, that's the piece that needs to be configured. Notice I use the word configure, not customize. When you pull the switches of the engine to make it work for you as a client, right? Another piece is also has to do with US and VAT compliance. It's more than just tax calculation. It's uh, if, uh, filing uh, the return filing your taxes, which we also uh, work with other companies to provide uh, e, uh, e invoices as well. And finally, many clients they need to have a need to manage exemption certificates. Mostly, that is something that you will find here in the United States uh, to a lesser degree in Canada and other countries. But we provide also a module that is part of the whole platform that allows you to manage the entire life cycle of, of, of exemption certificates from entry all the way to expiry notifications. And as it says right there, the last bullet is fully integrated with the tax engine, it's part of it itself. So thank you, thank you, Rowan. Yeah, and Rowan, thank just you. one, one yep. other comment on that that I'll jump in is why why does anyone care about this? Is it's that you could have four to eight thousand uh, tax rate rules policy changes in a year. Uh, so as you can imagine, that's pretty challenging to keep up on <laughs> globally. Uh, so hopefully we can take care of that for for your customers. 
But. No, I'm imagining a customer like DHL who we serve in, you know, approximately 50 countries. I think, um, I think they might be very interested if they're not already a customer. Awesome. Thank you very much. Really Thanks. interesting. Really interesting. I'm looking forward to the demo because my small brain doesn't necessarily encapsulate all this uh, fantastic <laughs> capability. So. We doubt right. that part about the small brain. We doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wasted on on other things. That's all. I all right. <laughs> fantastic introductions. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Kelly, Al, and Rolf. Uh, feel free to stick around or jump off. I know you guys are really important. Uh, lots of things going on. But um, we will hand over to Rizwan Malik, who's going to talk us through digital transformation and finance, talk a little bit about the, uh, the business case, the value that uh, these two solutions uh, bring. Absolutely. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you, uh, all the panelists. Uh, really insightful. Uh, what I wanted to really talk about is at a, at a global level, where are we today, right? Because tax compliance, whether it's in AP automation, it's still it's still very digitally disconnected. And what I mean by digitally disconnected is that people are still using paper. They're still using manual methods. When you look at a requisition or you look at a PO or an invoice, we come across so many companies that are still processing invoices manually or they're doing their taxes via spreadsheet, right? So we wanna we wanna eliminate that. So, and there's a lot of reasons why this is occurring, right? This could be because there are economic reasons. We, we there's also we just had the pandemic, and you would anticipate that a lot of companies would have become digitally connected. However, we're finding that that's not really the case. We did move in the right direction, but there's there's a lot of reasons, right? Uh, regulatory reasons. If you look at Europe right now, they are moving to digital invoicing, right? And that's a mandate by the uh, by the EU. This similar pattern is happening in South America as well. Mm -hmm. Although these are not the same things that are happening in the United States, right? In North America. So we feel like, you know, there's quite a few reasons for that, but we're still digitally disconnected. Next slide, please. And that's because we have, I mean, a lot of companies have developed a lot of great technology. However, they're still not using it, right? And, and as I mentioned, a lot of various reasons for that. They're still using manual methods, but I, I think there's a lot of opportunity here for a lot of organizations to go to that um, digitally connected. And I don't mean like OCR, right? OCR is an image. Um, what I'm really talking about is you've got a platform, you have a network where buyers and suppliers can come together and communicate, right? And they can interact. So technology is available. However, we're still not pushing to that. Next slide. And this is a, and what I want to highlight here is this is a study done by Ardent Partners, and they highlight what the AP agenda is and what are, the, what are their priorities for success. And the things they highlight are, you know, obviously reporting, analytics, so you can see where you are today, right? Implement an AP automation solution. Eliminate the paper, as we mentioned, and reduce these manual tasks. And we'll see that, um, you know, when once we get to the, the demo. And also submitting invoices electronically. My take and trade shifts take is enable and just kind of like flip the four to one, right? Which is admit, uh, you know, it, enable your suppliers to submit invoices digitally. Once you have that, right? Once you digitally connect, now you can do other things such as reduce these manual tasks, eliminate that paper, implement the AP automation, and then now you can perform those uh, analytics. And then you can also um, adhere to some of the KPIs, whether they're internal KPIs or external KPIs, and also become compliant. So we think it's, it's just, these are all the right areas, and this is the right agenda for AP organizations. We just think that they should be a little bit differently ordered. Um, and another similar thing um, that uh, what what this slide really shows is what are AP organizations currently using and what they plan on using within the next 24 months. And as you can see, you know, a lot of organizations are using an electronic invoicing solution. However, um, you know, not as many are planning to use that in the future. 
And as you can see at the top of um, this image, they're still using 77% of organizations are still using document scanning and imaging. This is a manual method, right? It produces errors. It produces a lot of exceptions. So you cannot uh, process straight through your invoices, your POs, your requisitions. And, and another thing that I, I believe that is uh, pretty important, as you'll be, you'll see a little bit later on, is the, the portal. I think when you have a portal, uh, it allows for suppliers to interact. It allows for buyers to interact. And there's a lot of value there. And there are organizations that are looking for, forward to using this. And the last thing I, wonder, I wanted to mention, is, which is I think is really undervalued, and Rolf mentioned it, and, and that's what TradeShip is. It's a business network, right? It allows for organizations, much like a LinkedIn, right? It allows for people to connect and collaborate. So we think there's a lot of opportunity in there as well, specifically in our cash uh, solutions. <clears throat> so just transitioning, what is really the value? What are we looking at? So when we look at supplier engagement and we look at um, uh, the network, one of the things that we find is a, a lot of organizations, AP organizations are really working on answering supplier inquiries. Where is my, where is my check? When will I be paid? Right. That is so organizations, AP staff 22. And I think that is going up, up to 25% is they're trying to reduce these inquiries, whether it be via email, phone calls, so if we eliminate that, so um, I think that will eliminate some and it'll promote those staff efficiencies, right? Again, on um, managing supplier master data, a lot of organizations really manage that on their own internally, the AP organizations. Let's move that and allow the, and give authorization and empower our suppliers to make that. And again, all of this, once you have a supplier uh platform, supplier engagement and network, this will increase your visibility. And it's found that best in class organizations are more likely to use um, a supplier portal than others uh, or their peers. Next. And specifically on AP automation, what we're really trying to achieve here is productivity from AP automation, right? Um, invoice exception rates. And when I say invoice exception rate, things such as there's no tax or it's incorrect tax, right? Um, the um, the price doesn't match or the qual quality or quantity of goods is not been delivered. So we want to increase the or decrease the invoice exception rates and have more straight through or touchless processing of those, whether it be a PO, whether it be an invoice, et cetera. Uh, same thing, late penalty fees, compliance and risk. As I mentioned earlier, there is country compliance risk for certain organizations, certain companies in Europe. So are you meeting those regulatory requirements? Are you prepared for that change, whether in South America or in Europe, right? So meeting and ensuring that we meet those, uh, those risks and tackle them head on, uh, we find that companies are getting charged, 58% are exposed for these uh, audits and these penalties. And the overpayment and loss, and, and I, you know, another part of this is fraud. Um, that typically happens through phishing, right? And it typically goes to the AP department. So that loss of overpayments due to fraud is also another area that we really need to tackle. Next. And now really the star of the show here today is, you know, the, the one source. Again, when we look at one source and, and the, 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 what it's trying to resolve, it's really trying to resolve those error rates on those invoices. I believe we can get that below 1%. And, you know, this is all part of the procure to pay process. So once it gets to the, the AP department, all these errors have occurred. So we wanna really tackle that at the requisition level. So reducing these error rates from three to 1% is huge savings. Uh, it saves a lot of time for the compliance team as well as the indirect tax team. The reason why that is, is because all of this is automated. It's on a single platform. It reduces that complexity. Uh, you have built-in reporting right? And it eliminates those manual and remedial tasks 
um, such as pulling reports or, um, you know, all those internal audits that are happening or the the, ta- the filing of taxes, right? So, so I think it remo- reduces those remedial tasks, but it also helps if you're entering a new market. So if you are expanding to Latin America or if you're expanding to Africa, it's already there for you. So it's just an extension and a configuration as Al mentioned also. And last but not least, um, it reduces, because it's all automated, it's a reduction in IT maintenance and it automatically updates those. So at the end, your return on investment can be as much as 120%. It's going to reduce the compliance teams as well as the indirect task team uh, uh, to other value added tasks. So with that, um, I think what we're going to see now, I'm gonna hand it back to Roman, but we're gonna see all of this in action with Eric and Al. I appreciate it, thank you. Thanks, Riz. I uh, I think back to those those surveys from Arden Partners that you showed the results from the surveys, and um, and I just wish people out there would it, it would make so much more sense to me that they would invest less in scan and capture and more in a tax determination engine. That would <laughs> yeah would actually yeah. add so much more value. All Absolutely. right, fantastic. Well, thanks thanks for walking us through that. So um, I believe now I'm going to hand over to uh, Eric and Al. And Eric, am I stopping sharing my screen now, or am yep, I going to continue? Yep. Just on? stop. Yeah. No. Stop, uh, and I'll, I'll all take right. over. There you go. Thank You're in you. Awesome. Right where we left off. All righty. So Al, I think Al, can you speak a little bit towards the kind of just cloud to cloud benefits here and how uh, just the kind of top level uh, integration for uh, trade shift in one source before I, yeah. I dive in? Yeah, absolutely. Let's give a, a little bit of um, uh, an idea of what is happening right here, right? So on the right hand side, you have a tax engine and then trade shift is on the left hand side, both products, you know, in the cloud. Trade shift is where uh, users are going to create Different types of uh, different type of transactions, such as requisitions, purchase orders, uh, invoice, invoices as well. The engine, however, is going to receive a request from TradeShift while these transactions have been generated or finalized. And at any time, at any time, a request for tax can come in from TradeShift, whether you are uh, modifying the requisition, adding things, whatever it may be, or finalizing it. Anytime I request it, that you wanted it to go, it goes into the engine. The engine is going to grab this information, and what goes into that uh, that request will be things such as ship from, ship to locations, an item, or a service that has been purchased that you need to pay. You can also send information on how much your vendor is charging you in tax. The engine is going to calculate the tax that, it, that the vendor should have charged, and then send that information back to TradeShift. A comparison will occur between the one source calculated tax and the vendor tax. And depending on the results of that comparison, you will be able to take some, some, some actions. On the left side, we see what the type of documents that are supported by TradeShift. And on the right hand side, some of the things that Kelly and I already talked about, all the 56,000 uh, tax jurisdictions and authorities that we support, all the countries that we support, you know, whatever. So TradeShift can send a transaction for U.S., Canada, uh, the, any country of the EU, whatever it may be. And you can configure all those flexible rules in a manner that will fit your company. At the same time, we're going to provide uh, a, a, a compliance module that would allow you to uh, set up and prepare your returns, not only for the U.S. and Canada, but for 50 other VAT uh, jurisdictions. Wonderful. Thank you. So now uh, just a couple more slides uh, before we get into a live environment. But I wanted to paint the picture as we get into a live environment, just how easy it is to get this up and running. So what we're going to see next is uh, I just took a screenshot of the environment. But uh, what we're seeing now is what the trade chip UI looks like. Uh, we, we pride ourselves. And I know it's kind of uh, a misnomer to say things are ease, ease of use while talking about it. But I'll try to just say it once. Uh, making things very consumer-like, easy to understand, so that people uh, that people in your AP department might be managing these things. You don't need to have you know the IT team get involved all the time. So, in terms of setting up the tax, uh, we 
go to the TapeShift configurator, which is where we can easily update some of the backend more technical uh, things to update on the platform. We have the tax configuration button on the left. And then we just have two kind of in plain English uh, decisions to make. For those people who have uh, who are on this call and are ready to sign up after this, they may have used this, the manual tax creation where users can manually do what, what, what we're talking about. But now, now that everyone's seen the light, they're going to use this button on the right hand side to connect uh, their one source account to trade shift and what that looks like uh, after clicking on that button they would be brought to once again just a few easy kind of configuration steps inside the system here at the top that i've highlighted is where uh, a user would put in their one source login credentials then there's just a few toggle switches that they're going to turn things on uh, we can see that top green box the tax servant integ integration that's literally the kind of on and off button for this whole integration the next line down to calculate taxes, uh, I've enabled it on my system. That's what Al was talking about, where we're going to see just in a moment how the, the one source engine is going to generate taxes based on a purchase request. Uh, we're also going to go through that, that third box is where we're going to validate taxes on incoming invoices. And then the last part there is setting up a default assignee. We're also going to see that. I, I've set it to Owen. We'll, we'll talk about Owen, who's just my my kind of general user that we uh, are going to be looking through the eyes of here in a moment. Uh, this could go to a, a single user or a group of user. And this is exact, this is where uh, any discrepancies, meaning if if and when the, t uh, the, the one source engine says uh, there's an error, this is who we would send these errors to either a group of people on TradeShift or a single user. And then last but not least, we need to set up some tolerances. In this case, uh, I've kind of flattened it out to make it really easy to understand. Uh, what we're seeing here is I've created a tolerance for all invoices at all document levels, meaning we could decide if we wanted it just to look at header level or line items. We can delineate those to have maybe different tolerances if need be. Uh, you can segregate it by different currencies if you want to. I've set mine to all, meaning it's going to catch any currency. And then we have an absolute and a percentage value for variance. And we need at least one of these, but oftentimes we see uh, that companies use both. So uh, in this case, I've set it to zero, but you, for sake of example, if I had set it to $5, what that means is if there's an error that comes in that's less than $5, it's not gonna create a task. It's gonna go straight through because your organization has decided that it's not worth your time to, to update, uh, you know, a, a fix an error if it's less than $5 and the same for the percentage. So without further ado, uh, sorry, I said two slides, it's three. Uh, I'm gonna come back to this slide. Um, all right, I'm gonna come back to this slide. Uh, it's kind of like my uh, path, just to help make sure that I'm driving home the conversation um, to make sure that everyone understands where, uh, where I'm talking, what I'm talking about, because I understand that I look at this stuff all day and it's really exciting to me, but maybe this is the first time that people are looking at the procure to pay space. So what we're looking at right now in that blue box is a representation of the trade chip platform and all the, the processes, very generalized that happen on that platform. So from procure to pay, uh, and then at the bottom is where we tend to integrate with external systems uh, once things have been completely validated and they go to an okay to pay folder. Um, so what the first thing we're gonna see is this, the creation of a requisition and that initial call that Alan and many people have talked about, we're, we're the ones we're gonna call the one source engine. Once again, cloud to cloud, we're gonna get a real time tax generation where it's gonna uh, give us a uh, clear suggestion, a real suggestion of what these taxes should be based on this real uh, information. So uh, here we go into the live environment, let's do that. So we're now, in the trade shift platform. And I realize I'm getting excited and talking very quickly. I'm gonna to try to slow down. Uh, I apologize. We're now looking through the eyes of Owen and this is our general procurement user. Uh, once again, try to make the call out that we, we, we've created a very kind of consumer-like uh, user interface. We pride ourselves on, on, on how kind of intuitive these processes are. And we're gonna start by creating a purchase request. And we're now gonna, use it once again i think we're kind of all used to creating a basket full of items and checking out so that's exactly what i'm going to do i'm going to create a couple items let's say that this user is just getting some office supplies today i'm going to add this item to the basket i'm going to put two and you'll understand two different items you'll understand why in a second i'm going to add these two different items to a basket 
open up this basket and here we have our two items ready to go. If we needed to make any adjustments to quantity or get rid of things, we could do that from here. But I'm gonna go ahead and check this out. So now what Trace is doing is pulling all this information into a purchase request and pulling in uh, any attributes that are that are Owens on this system. For example, Owen has a default delivery address. So we don't have to add that because every time Owen makes a purchase request, it's gonna go here. Uh, I've also configured mine um, to require a description for the webinar. Um, and then for sake of example, but also because this is a very real world uh, case that I hear about a lot, uh, because there's the delivery address, I wanna go ahead and open up the details for one of these two items. Scroll down, we have our you know, counting details, which is some of that date, that data that's gonna be going out to the one source engine to help them generate those taxes. Because as Al said, we need to know kind of what these items are in order for them to know if a tax is exempt or for example. Um, but what I'm gonna do here is change the delivery address for this one item to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And just to make sure that everyone's uh, still awake there on the other side of the camera, if anyone knows what the address is, you get a virtual high five uh, from myself. No points. I guess I don't have anything to give, but just, just to make sure everyone's still awake. Um, so what we have here is uh, the purchase request ready to go. Uh, with two separate delivery addresses, which is really important. So when I click ready to submit, it's now sending out this purchase request to the OneSource cloud, as Al talked about. And once again, kind of easy, plain to read uh, information. We like to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. We can see up here on the top, the tax identification is in process. So right now, all that data is being sent out. And in real time, I'm going to refresh. We're going to now see that there has been two purchase orders created from this purchase request. Um, and uh, the two purchase orders uh, are living here on the top right now. And then we can also see what's most important is these two separate taxes. And we could, we could hover over them if we wanted to know, but at the bottom here, we also have a very detailed list of all of those various taxes that are required for these items based on what they are and where they're going. So uh, I know Al talked about it a lot, but this is where we can clearly see San Francisco has a lot going on. Uh, we've got all the different sales taxes required for counties uh, and different uh, district taxes. And then thank you, DC, you have a very flat 6% tax on your item, which is a little bit easier to understand. So what we just saw was a purchase request being created in TradeShift. Um, we saw that requisition, we saw the, the, the call out to the one source engine. We then saw the purchase order sent out to the supplier. And now we're gonna change gears and mm -hmm. I'm gonna flip back into the system to um, show what uh, the supplier can do on that end. Uh, hey, goods receipts, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, can, can you show back where you were, the, they had the taxes for DC and, 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 sure. and, and for California? Because that really shows quite well what you're doing right here. So Owen was generating this particular requisition, right? So Owen didn't have to know anything about taxation, didn't know whether uh, DC, the taxes may be, so on and so forth. What you just illustrated right here, Eric, is the fact that the engine can calculate tax at the header level, or as in this case, in a requisition, you may have two, three, four different, whatever it may be, different items shipping to different locations. So the engine will be able to calculate tax at the line level. Like for example, the first one, I think you were saying it to, to Washington DC. So right there, all we have is taxation of 6% at the district level, DC district level. Whereas in San Francisco, they, in California specifically, they tax you even if you, if you walk and chew gum at the same time. And you can see all the different jurisdictions that we have not only 6% for the state, but uh, the county for San Francisco has different transactions for many, many things, including BART, which is the, uh, the underground, the, 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 the uh, transportation, public transportation system. So what Owen had to do is really nothing when it came to taxes because the engine is the one that is going to resolve, calculate the taxes accurately based on the information that is provided through uh, trace shift when generating the requisition. Thanks, Eric. And I was uh, just going to add to that, Al, um, normally, you know, what organizations and we, when I talked about digitally disconnected, normally what, what an organization or a person in the tax department or, or a requisitioner 
would be they would be looking this up in a in a spreadsheet or or some kind of file, right? And and so it just takes time, right? And you, as you can Absolutely. see, this was, done, this was done automatically by the system. And, and another thing I mentioned earlier was this type of thing produces exceptions. So if it it's an exception, someone has to stop what they're doing and actually have to look at it and put these taxes in and, and make sure that they're correct. So again, you, you're just promoting efficiencies and automation, and now you're digitally connected. And the key word over there is automation, because now if you were to create another item uh, that you're going to ship it to Atlanta, you will see that here in Atlanta, where I live, taxation is almost as crazy as San Francisco. You will have uh, six, seven different lines, uh, same thing, not only the county, the city, or whatever, for different locations. So how can Susie or Johnny on the back end, in the back office, keep track of all these taxes around the nation, when 10 miles to the west, you have another set of uh, taxes, and then you go another 10 miles to the north, which is another county maybe, and it's another set of, 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 of taxation, right? So that's what the engine does, take the decision-making process away from those folks generating these transactions. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, no, thank you both, that was great. Um, just to make sure everyone's still on the same page, I wanna go back here and say, what we just saw was all the requisition part and calling out to one source, I'm now going to follow that purchase order back to this supplier, and we're going to look at trade shift through the eyes of the supplier. Uh, we're going to flip that uh, purchase order into an invoice and then send that back to uh, trade shift. So let's let's go ahead and do that now. And uh, you'll see now why it's so important for me to really call out what we're doing, because the user interface is exactly the same for your suppliers. And the reason that is, is because uh, I think Rolf mentioned it before, is buyers and suppliers can, you know, any buyer can be a supplier on the network, suppliers can be buyer, and we encourage that type of, uh, you know, engagement on the on the B2B network because, um, you know, we're trying to create economic opportunity for everyone out there. Uh, and if we had two different softwares, that would kind of defeat the, defeat the purpose. So we're here in as uh, the supplier, I'm going to open up the document manager, which is where all the documents on the system would live. We can see now that at the top here, we have the two purchase orders that both went to the same seller but because we had those two uh, delivery addresses, we have them separated. I'm going to select the one that's, uh, that's going to DC because it's a little clear. We can see here now that we have the purchase order with the tax in there already generated. Uh, the, the supplier can then easily change the status of this just to make sure, back to Riz's point, clear lines of communication are going to cut down on any sort of communication that your supplier might be needing, as well as your team. If you're wondering, hey, did, did my supplier get that? They can flip, you know, check check the accepted box. That's going to reflect on the buyer side as well, making sure that we know that they've received it and that they're working on things. But then just as easily, they can click the large green button that creates invoice and what's happening now is it's taking all that information from the purchase order and turning it into an invoice. Another little value add here is uh, we have the next available invoice number based on the, the kind of supplier systems. Uh, so that this cuts down on those errors as well. There's not gonna be duplicates. Uh, if a user were to have put in their own invoice number here and it is already in use, um, it would get an error out right off the bat, not letting them send it. But for sake of example, I'm gonna go ahead and do exactly what would never happen, hopefully. I'm gonna change this tax that was already so graciously provided by one source to this egregious 55%, just to make my point clear. Um, I'm, I'm gonna do that and we're gonna go ahead and send this back uh, to, to Owen. Uh, so just to be clear of what's happening right now, we're here at number four, the supplier is sending that invoice back into trade shift. And now we're gonna get this last step where right now what's happening is trade shift and one source are talking to each other. It's saying, hey, no, this is, uh, you know, was supposed to be at 6%. And we're gonna go back in as Owen, because uh, if you'll remember, I said Owen is the default assignee in that, in that uh, integration step at the beginning. Um, he's gonna see a, uh, an error and we can see what that looks like uh, in trade shift. I do wanna call out that what we're showing with this kind of path that I'm demonstrating now makes it a little harder to understand, but you get this value, the same value for a non-purchase order invoice. So if your suppliers don't have the PO to go off of and they're just uh, you know, manually putting in the taxes, hopefully are not putting in any taxes, this is when one source really has a lot of value or they're gonna be able to call out these errors. And now I, I you know, created one myself by adding that 55% tax. Um, 
So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So now we're back in as Owen and I'm gonna open up the task manager and Owen is our tax review person. So his tax or his uh, task manager is full of these tax reviews. Uh, you can see that you know, TradeShip does have a full robust built out workflow where we can handle all kind of relevant AP and P2P types of uh, uh, workflows. So just wanted to call that out that right now we're just focusing on the, the tax review. I'm gonna open up this one uh, and we're going to see now, once again, calling out the kind of clear, easy to understand, plain English. This is exactly why this person has this document. It's assigned to you for tax review. A few other things that are just kind of uh, ease of use. Uh, we have the sender. We can easily see who this is going to. I, I, the buying organization in this case is Thompson Reuters. They are a customer as well as a, a great uh, partner of ours. Um, as well as any related documents, we've trade shift is matched up with the goods receipt, the the purchase order, the, the purchase request. If we needed to go in and review these documents, I could easily click into this space and pull up that document. But then, kind of most powerfully, once again, in very clear, easy to read English, we can see that the seller would charge the tax of three hundred eighteen dollars, which is more than the calculated tax of three hundred forty seven by the difference here, and that you've allowed a variance of zero dollars. You'll remember we set that up uh, in that first step. So what it's saying is, hey, there's a big error here. Here's what one source says it should be. Uh, what are you gonna do about it? And it's the same with the percentage. It's also looking at the, the percentage saying, hey, that 55% you put in is, is very different than the 6% that it should be based on one source's calculations. What are we gonna do now? Now, one of the things that would be a kind of common use case, maybe not with such a big variance, uh, but another huge value and a differentiator for trade shift is the open lines of communication built throughout. So what I'm looking at here is this collaboration functionality that's on every document inside the system. So uh, as a buying organization, I have the ability to create an internal conversation or an external conversation. In this case, uh, I opened up an internal conversation and what you're gonna see is a couple really big values. First, it's an audit trail. This comes, in, this comes in really handy at the end of the year. If you're ever wondering where this document was, what happened to it, it's a timeline of all the associated documents and any sort of call outs that happen. So we can see that the purchase request happened. We can see that it spawned those two purchase orders that we saw. We can see the invoice came in. Uh, I didn't show the goods receipt, but TradeShift can do goods receipting as well as integrating with systems that if you're doing your goods receipting elsewhere, it can all show up here. And then finally, it's another, it's a new means of communication, both internally and externally. So here we see Owen reaching out to April, maybe someone who's more involved with the, the taxes saying, hey, do we need to check these taxes before we reject? April comes back with a shameless plug for one source and says, no, one source has done all of their work. We know that we can just, uh, you know, send this back as an error. So what Owen can then do is flip this over to an external conversation. Once again, this is all gonna live alongside this document for as long as it's in the system. The, the supplier, when we use this, and so now we're sending out a message to the supplier saying, hey, uh, supplier, we have this error. You might you know, flex a little and say, hey, we know it should be 6%. I'm gonna do your homework for you. Please change it to 6%. The supplier can then communicate back using TradeShift so what that looks like is uh, anytime that this happens, they're going to get an email as well saying, hey, you have a new communication in trade shift. They can easily click in and it'll bring them back into the platform to respond. Um, so in this case, we'll kind of let the supplier know if we need to do any work internally or externally, all that can be done here. We can attach documents. We can do everything that you might want to do with a, a, a means of communication without the need of chasing down emails or making sure that you have the right contact. It's all going to be here in the system. So now this user has a few things to do, uh, a few decisions to make. I just want to highlight those. We have, we could forward it for approval if you needed, you know, if, if we wanted to just send it through anyway, we could do that. We could send this to April. We could reassign this task that we're looking at to someone else in the organization that has the, appro the appropriate uh, approval limits or whatever set up in the system, or we can reject it back to the supplier, which is what we're going to do in this uh, scenario. Uh, so we can say, please change to 6% and uh, reset. So we're asking our supplier to resend this document once they've made the, the appropriate changes. They're gonna get an email saying, hey, this was wrong. They'll also get a notification in the system. Um, and uh, that's, that's kind of the, the full 
the full flow, just to kind of reiterate what we just saw. Um, as that invoice came back from the supplier, we called the one source engine again. The one source engine said, are these taxes correct? There's only two options here. If it's yes, that would be kind of passed down the line. If there are any other errors, the work, the trade shift workflow would catch those and we could deal with them in a very similar manner as we just saw in the tax or in the in the task uh, task center. And then if not, in this case, there's you know a few different reasons why there might be errors. Either the vendor charged no tax, uh, they undercharged or they overcharged. And then as we saw, the user then has a few different actions to go through. They could approve it with those errors for whatever reason. They could reassign that task uh, to someone else in, in, the, in the organization. They can do what we did, which is reject that back to the supplier, adding any sort of collaboration messages that they want. And then the part that I didn't really go over also might be a use case that we could also re-trigger the taxes. So if we wanted to go back maybe into our system and adjust those tolerances for whatever reason, uh, we could send that document back to one source for kind of checking it again, which is uh, one that I didn't show, but also a possibility. Um, and Erica, I know, sorry. Yeah, there's a question in the chat that refers about resending. So if this, the, the question from Muriel says, when you resend example PO is incorrect and was fixed, well, the PO, uh, when, when, when we actually create a requisition or a PO, that's nothing more than an estimate of tax. The actual validation that occur, occurs at the invoice level, when the invoice, the tax on the invoice, not the PO, that's the piece that is going to be correct or not. So what uh, what Eric is, uh, is showing here is a, a invoice time. So a PO and requisition time, the only thing that occurs is a calculation of an estimate of tax. Sometimes the folks generating that uh, PO uh, sometimes generating that particular uh, requisition, they may include that estimate of tax in the PO, but more often than not, uh, more often than not, they will not. So the validation of the vendor tax occurs only at the PO level. I hope that answers your question, Mario. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, that, that was great. That was, you know, I think back growing, I think we're actually in the kind of Q&A part. Uh, I think yeah. I got through everything I wanted to show in, in plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there were a few questions uh, that were answered uh, by the, uh, you know, by by the presentations. Um, here's one uh, probably for you, Al. Mm -hmm. Is the one source system modular? Can we take the indirect tax first and then adopt, say, income tax or some other capability? Oh, absolutely. So depending on the licensing, when you sign in into the one source platform, uh, the user uh, we'll see the different tiles to whatever that they are licensed to. So there might be a tile that is a specific to indirect tax, and that is where you are going to configure the tax calculations for the particular companies. Uh, if you are licensed to income tax, then you will see that tile. So anything of that little wheel that at the beginning, because I'm sure everybody remembers everything that we showed, uh, that you're going to see the different tiles for whether it's going to be income tax, it's going to be trade show, whatever it may be. So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Well, um, that's that's most of it. Um, I wanted to give the last word to Kelly. I just wanted to, you know, ap appreciate you for uh, joining you and Al. This has been really good. I want to thank the entire audience for taking the time and our other speakers. Um, what I took from this, Kelly, was uh, three words. So I'm in product marketing, so I like to, you know, just bring everything down and what i got was uh automation clarity and confidence that is what i think these combined solutions offer and um i wanted to give that to you and i wanted to give you the opportunity to uh share anything that you think would be valuable to the audience that didn't get said i think those are the top three for sure rowan i i like that you boiled it down to three that's usually what people can take away from uh some of these you know big webinars um however i i did kind of think as we were having our discussion and going through this you know if for those of you out there that aren't as familiar with all the you know tax and compliance details i kind of thought through the you know the company benefits are uh, what we all just kind of went through um, and having your platform and our platform cloud native and, you know, talking real time. I think the efficiencies and, you know, reducing risk is huge. 
Um, and the one thing that probably isn't as quite apparent is, you know, old traditional methodologies were a lot of emails and phone calls. I think uh, Rizwan mentioned that, um, you know, going back and forth to resolve these invoices and get them correct. Um, but that can really break down the supply chain uh, and your vendor management overall. Um, and even potentially, I know this used to happen to us is putting, um, you know, some of our, our supply chain or vendors on hold. Um, and so that's a real break uh, in the cycle end to end, uh, which we, we know we all experienced during COVID and, you know, the testing of some of the supply chain overall. Um, but also what folks might not be aware of is that um, the implications for trapping cash in a jurisdiction is a, is a challenge um, when you don't have the tax correct. And also all your tax compliance cycles for uh, sales and use tax, um, VAT and GST are monthly. Uh, so downstream, if these are not reconciled real time uh, through that AP process, then your tax teams, finance teams, et cetera, are having to catch that every month. Um, and if it's incorrect, there's a further risk. So I guess, you know, those are the only other things I thought we should land today and make sure it's kind of clear for those aren't, that aren't as familiar with that. So there's kind of the business benefits um, and then also the downstream effects that, that are pretty challenging for organizations. Really well said. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Al, Eric. That was a demo for the ages. Loved it. Riz, always uh, always fun to hear you speak. Rolf, we'll give you a little bit more airtime next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks, also, everyone. Enjoyed. Enjoyed it. Good. Thank you. Good, good. Thank Thanks, you Al. to the audience. Take care. Everyone.